and welcome to the Kuyamange Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach. And on behalf of our Board of Directors and Advisors and Volunteers and Supporting Members, we do want to thank you for joining us today. The Kuyamange Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas. We talk about experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. It's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's why we call this conversation for exploration. And we've had weekly discussions here, um, broad topics from archaeology and archaeoastronomy, ecology, philosophy, uh, mythology, roots of theater, deep history. It goes on and on and on. It's from a the, big universe out there, and we go exploring. From the arts to the sciences. So much more. We have a couple hundred of these presentations available on our website as webcasts, also as podcasts. So you're welcome to, uh, they're all for free. They're all there for your use. So join us at Institute.com. And of course, we invite you to become a supporting member as a nonprofit who want to also thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Kuyamange Institute. You know, humanity has this odd relationship. Sometimes we forget about the connections that we have to all of life that surrounds us. We get lost in our own internal battles, our battles between each other, and we devastate things around us. And then we have to find ways for rebuilding, for re recapturing and re-understanding that deeper need of what life is all about. That is, is that everything that surrounds us in this universe is an extension of ourselves. We have to relearn that lesson over and over and over again. And so we come to a point where instead of working against nature and bulldozing and creating war and doing the things that we do, we come up to individuals who have vision, people who feel it's time to grab the tiger by the tail, literally in this case. And um, lions, perhaps. Lions by the tail, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that we have this working relationship to really honor, to respect, and to realize how important that that life is to our life and that we celebrate those stories, these modern day heroes. Well, indeed, so many stories, so many examples of paradise lost. Perhaps the most tragic, the most senseless are through war. And such was the case for a million acres safari park in Mozambique. In its heyday, Gorongosa had it all. Aerial surveys counted the easily spotted 500 lions, 3000 zebras, and hippos, 6,000 elephants, 5,000 wildebeest, 14,000 buffalo, and then civil war erupted. Battles were fought inside the park. Aerial bombing destroyed buildings and roads. Landmines and snares hid in the brush. Elephants were slaughtered for ivory to buy arms and supplies. Soldiers ate the game while lions died of starvation or were shot for sport. And in the two decades of this war and its aftermath, 90% of the animals vanished, the park desolate, broken, until Great Carr, American entrepreneur, philanthropist, and visionary came along. In the last two decades, working with the local people and partnering with the Mozambican government, Goringosa is once again thriving. And today, Greg has brought Elisa Langa, director of Gorongosa's Human Development and Livelihoods, with a focus on girls' education and empowerment, to share the story of how he and his team accomplished what National Geographic calls perhaps Africa's greatest wildlife restoration project. They join us from Gorongosa, Africa. Hello and welcome. So good to welcome. have you here. Yes. 
So good to hear about the people who are doing some good in the world. So thank you. I want to say that, of course, nature herself uh, alone will eventually rewild her planet. She's had the formula down and perfected for a few billion years. But to hasten this healing along and to understand how all the parts of an ecosystem work together and how human communities need heal from war to rebuild and to work with nature so that all thrive. Huge project. Where does where did you begin 20 years ago? <laughs> Well, thank you for having us. I'm I'm sitting next to uh, the Mozambican leader, Alinga, Alisa Langa. And, uh, you know, for 500 years, Mozambique has been known as Terra de Boa Gente, which means land of the good people in Portuguese. Wow. And Alisa wow. is a shining example of that. So uh, I'll be sharing 50% of the screen time with her. In fact, we, I, I think she should get 51 but um, how did this happen is your question. Um, 20 years ago, uh, I was approached by a visionary man, the president of Mozambique named Chisano. And his country had just gone through a generation of war, which you mentioned a million people were killed. And mm. I'm sitting here in central Mozambique in Gorongosa National Park, which is their nation's treasure. At one time, Gorongosa had the densest abundance of wildlife on the continent of Africa. But oh. as you said, during this war, they lost almost all their animals. And the president of Mozambique contacted me. I was, I was known for doing human rights in the United States. I was not known for doing things in Africa. But he said, Greg, come and help us. And mm -hmm. we want to restore our national treasure. And we want to help the people that suffered in this war. And... I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm not exactly someone who knows how to run a national park, but he said, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for someone who cares about humanity. We want to change the definition of national park to a place that cares about its neighbors who live next to the park. The park is the cultural and spiritual and biological heritage of the Mozambicans like Elisa, it's their land. And the president of Mozambique said, yes, we want to restore the park, but we want to store, restore these people's lives. And we want to restore the soul, the spirit of Gorongosa. Because as, as you talked about human connection to the earth in your opening comments, well, we are part of the earth. We evolved here. We are one of the species. If we destroy this planet, we're destroying our own soul. So that, so we started 20 years ago. Uh, we brought back wildlife from other countries. And, and honestly, that was not the difficult part. Nature is very resilient. The, the bigger challenge was helping these poor people that had suffered in the war. And that's where I'm going to turn to Elisa. We spend a lot more of our time and money outside the National Park with 200,000 people that live in 16 communities. And Elisa is the leader. She provides health care, mobile clinics into very remote areas. She works in 100 schools with 60,000 children and provides after-school clubs. She provides clubs that keep girls in school and out of child marriage. She trains public school teachers and she works with thousands of farmers. So here's the real hero. And Elisa, do you, what do you wanna say about, uh, about the work you're doing? Welcome, Elisa. I will say that's one call to adventure. And uh, and that's the part that this story doesn't often uh, highlight, isn't it? Yeah. And as an educator, a educator, and and that impact, and all the different things that we're talking about here, it's it's so uh, significant and important. So so welcome, and we'd love to to have your your vision of what you see happening and where it's come from and where is it going. Thank you. It, it's my pleasure to be here with you and to share our experience here. Uh, as Greg said, we are really doing um, several things among our communities to help them to have ownership 
of their own development. Mm -hmm. This is important to us that uh, people recognize their importance uh, in taking this uh, uh, world over. Mm -hmm. uh, as Greg said, uh, we have education programs because we believe that education is key if we want to change the world. Mm. We cannot do nothing without education. In all the programs that we implement here, either uh, health, community relations, agriculture, and all of them, uh, the central thing we do, it's related to education. Yes. To access to information because people need information. We work with people who are living in rural areas, in remote areas where they don't have any kind of information. Television, radio, newspapers, they don't have any information. So when you go to the people, you take uh, uh, good messages, you give them opportunities to know more things about the world about what they need to do to develop their own lives. Yes. So this is what we- New do. possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so uh, we implement, in fact, education programs, teacher training programs uh, to improve the teacher skills so that they can be able to teach their kids in proper way. Yes. It's challenging here in Mozambique, as like in other parts of Africa, uh, education, because we have a lot of kids in schools and not enough materials and not enough even teachers to mm. teach. Mm. So we find uh, uh, classrooms with more than 60 kids and one teacher to, 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 to teach those, those kids. So our, our work here is to make sure that uh, these teachers are motivated enough to do their best to teach these kids in a proper way. I was gonna say you're doing the, what, what, civil, what indigenous wisdom has done forever, which is to reset and reclaim our right relations with ourselves, our community, our world around us. And tell us about the girls' school and about the advanced degrees that are possible that, mm -hmm. that you've all set up there. I also wanted to comment that the concept of education that you're talking about is mentorship. You're talking about beyond just book learning. You're talking about being able to instill in the children a responsibility to their community, a responsibility to their environment. Well, and new possibilities for their lives, that the, child, that the girls don't have to get married early. Those that they can go on and have careers and an education and contribute yes. in other ways. <laughs> all right? of those, all of the above, yes. Yes, sure. Uh, girls clubs is one of our programs here. Uh, we do um, girls clubs with all the girls uh, within our communities. Mm -hmm. So we have more than 3,000 girls attending our uh, after school clubs oh, wow. uh, with the aim of uh, letting them complete their studies because as you said, uh, many girls in rural areas get married uh, with two, 12, uh, 30 or, or 14 years old. So we make sure that uh, girls have opportunities to, 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 to study and to complete uh, 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 their studies yes. uh, and we, we do it with the teachers because they are the ones who, who have to make sure that uh, 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 the kids will be motivated at classroom yeah. and we do it all, also with our promoters uh, the volunteers that we have that they do the after school clubs to ensure that girls understand what the teachers are, are, are teaching at school. Mm -hmm. As you and, know, and one of the points just to add to that, 
one of the points you made was about mentoring. What, what Elisa does that's so amazing is she brings role models to these young girls. She she brings professional women who uh, might be doctors, might be engineers, might be Ranger. certified safari guides or rangers and they they meet these young girls so then these girls can imagine themselves being more than just uh, a, a subsistence farmer frankly they, and then they can dream they can go to college um and when, to give you a sense of the challenge that elisa has when i came here the vast majority of adults had not been to a single day of school in their life so where do you begin Mm, indeed. So you also have a higher education degree right in the park that people can earn. Tell us about that. Yeah, we actually have um, a master's in conservation biology. That's a two-year program that we teach inside this national park. It's the only national park in the world that has a two-year master's degree. And it's it's always Mozambicans. Uh, and they get an outstanding degree, and it's the only one in this country as well. So we're proud of that, but we also bring a lot of undergraduate students through, high school students as interns. You see, we wanted to change the definition of national park. You know, last century, people thought, oh, national park, oh, that's just where tourists go and look at animals, and, and they, there was that's a very tiny definition. Mm -hmm. And we think of the National Park as an education institution. We're a one million oh, acre wow. laboratory. We have 70, 70 universities affiliated with this park, and people coming from all over the world, getting their PhDs and, and, and as tenured and senior professors doing research. We're training conservation scientists for the whole world. Always half of them are Mozambique and we make sure of that and from other parts of Africa because we're at risk right now on this planet. As everybody on this uh, Zoom knows, we're losing our biodiversity. We're losing it fast and climate change is gonna cause more loss. And then yeah. if the if the species in 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 on this planet earth uh collapse we're going to go with it because we're one of those species so we're while we're learning how to restore this ecosystem we're actually developing lessons for develop for for restoring any ecosystem around the world and people are publishing papers and they're going back home to where they come from so you could find another distressed place on this planet and you could say well we want to restore that Say so, well, well, you know, there's lessons learned, and we and and we've learned how to do it. Um, we're restoring the, the the rainforest on Mount Gorongosa. It's really critical because we get our water from Mount Gorongosa, and we're losing that rainforest. And so we went to the people who live up there, and they love that forest uh, as as their spirituality is connected to that forest. And we said, well, why don't we grow agricultural crops with you that thrive inside a rainforest mm -hmm. so at the same time they're making more money than they've ever made before so they can send their kids to school and and have enough to eat they're restoring a rainforest there's a lot of things that grow well inside a rainforest you can grow black pepper you can grow vanilla other vine crops coffee crops tree crops so that's an example of living in harmony with nature uh, but a really touching story for me We've brought back a lot of the animals here that were completely gone. And see, Mozambicans, they all have a spirit animal in their family. And we have a, a, the, the, the park warden of Gorongosa, a beautiful man named Pedro. And uh, he his spirit animal for his family is, is, is a painted wolf. And that's a very, very rare species, uh, only found in Africa. And we restored the painted wolves to Gorongosa, and he said he hadn't seen one in 30 years. And when he saw them back here, he said it restored his soul. So this is not just about, you know, the abstraction of biodiversity or the or, you know, making some money, growing like something. Personal relationships. This is, yeah. this is about restoring our souls as human beings that, that if, if we destroy nature, you know, it. why is the first story in western civilization the adam and eve story and what did adam and eve do they were living in paradise a natural paradise they <laughs> made mistakes and they were thrown out that's the first story 
in Paradise our lost. civilization. Yeah. And here we are all over the world. What are we doing? Destroying nature. And we have to repent for those sins, so to speak, restore, whether it's your neighborhood or Gorongosa Park, to get back into paradise again and be in harmony with nature. Well. Yeah. So we do that by looking at what all parts of the ecosystem, by taking the indigenous wisdom and our modern wisdom and combining them and supporting them. I mean, why why operate with one half of the equation? Let's put it all on the table. And um, tell us about adding the Mount Gorongosa to the park. That was a that was a big step. That was an important step. Well, you know, um, Na most most of the national parks in this world were created last century mm -hmm. and they were actually created before we really understood the discipline of ecology isn't that yeah. interesting yeah. in other words ideally the boundaries of a national park would fit with an ecosystem now look at yellowstone park it's a big square on the map right mm -hmm. in other words it's Is nature working boundary, squares a natural yeah. boundary and yeah. and if you have an ecosystem you need to protect the water catchments you need to pay attention to where the wildlife go so now they're trying to correct for that mistake of yellowstone they're trying to create corridors up to glacier park and even up to yukon they're trying to protect rivers well in gorongosa was made a long long time ago uh more or less a square on the map but they didn't include the source of the water. And, and if you lose the water, you're gonna lose everything. So we needed to protect Mount Gorongosa uh, because that's where the rivers come from. So we asked the government to add it to the park. However, we are not last century's national park. We are this century's national park. We're a human rights national park. So we did not say to the people who live there, oh, you gotta leave, you can't live in a national park. That's wrong thinking. Yeah. Those people love that mountain. They love that mountain more than anybody. They're going to protect it more than They're anybody. Part of the we mountain. said yeah. that we're going to help you protect your spiritual home, which is this mountain. And this is what Elisa and her team do. They work up there and and they uh, help families to earn an income. Now, a lot of these families suffered through a war. Yeah. And 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 Elisa runs something she calls peace clubs, which helps people wow. to come back to their communities and restart their lives. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard of. Yeah. Elisa, you want to talk more about that, Elisa? Yeah, tell us about your vision. Uh, about yes, peace, clubs? About, about peace clubs, yes. As Greg said, we are helping uh the, the ex-combatants uh to back. Uh, 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 home to go back home and uh, to be accepted by the 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 their neighbors and the communities mm -hmm. so we we do it uh through um adult literacy and we take this opportunity of giving them uh, uh, that opportunity to learn how to read and write their names etc we take that opportunity to discuss with them about other themes like uh, uh, human rights, like the importance of education for their kids, because we found that most of the ex-combatants kids were out from school. So we discuss it with them to make sure that all kids can have access to school. Mm -hmm. So we do it with them, we, we play with them, we, we, we do sports with mm -hmm. them, to build trust right. among them within the community. Mm -hmm. So everybody so has a role, everybody has a place, everybody's welcome. Yeah. Yeah, everybody. So the peace club is not only for the ex-combatants, but it's for all people. Yes. Mm -hmm. All are involved and engaged in this, but we are focusing on them to make sure that they are not uh, uh, living behind. Because so really, we, we can only be healthy better. when everything is healthy, right? We can't yes. be healthy isolated. We have to be healthy in community yes. with the entire environment, with everybody. Yes. Yeah.
But I'm from Maputo and Gorongosa. Since a uh, few years ago, we start uh, hearing uh, good news about Gorongosa. And I became interested to know more about what has been done here in Gorongosa. So I listened to news, I read newspapers, etc. So I became interested. That's why I applied. <laughs> you heard the call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's such a now rich she's my boss. <laughs> yeah, now she's your boss. Well, uh, there's such a rich fabric uh, of uh, community that you're 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 speaking about, and and you know those of us from this part of the world don't fully understand the depth of community and the history. When you start talking about the motherland Africa, going back to going back to the beginning of civilization itself, there's a there's a relation. Not civilization, just humanity. Humanity, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's just a there, there's just a connectedness whether you you call it ritual whether you call it uh, you know celebration what do you call it but there's something that humanity has had to come to these to the table so many times in these types of situations to be it, renewed and refreshed renewed and refreshed yeah, yeah. so it seems yeah. like come back to source yeah, yeah. exactly so. well you know it's interesting um, Gorongosa Park is located in the Great Rift of Africa. And I think everybody knows what the Great Rift of Africa is. Oh, yeah. That's where Homo sapiens began. Mm -hmm. And we're right there. And what's exciting about Gorongosa is that the ecosystem hasn't changed that much in terms of flora and fauna in the last 100,000 years. So in other words, a human being, an early human being, 100,000 years ago, was right here where we're sitting. Mm -hmm. And they would have been seeing the same animals, hearing the same birds, smelling the same smells. Mm -hmm. And and so as we restore Gorongosa, we're restoring our origins as a species. Our collective as soul. We look, isn't mm -hmm. that crazy? And we have fossils we have fossils that are a are fairly recent origin going all the way back 20 million years. We had 40 people here this month finding fossils. Now, 20 of them Mozambicans. As I say, we always make sure half of our scientists are Mozambican. But we're finding fossils from time periods that no one's ever found fossils before. So we're going to learn about the entire evolution of life, including ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. um, and where do we go from here? Exactly. I'm... How did you restore? You talked about the we see the same flora and fauna. How did you restore it? What were the steps involved to hasten that process? Mm -hmm. You brought in well, a the, few from yeah, the outside. Good, the good and... thing about nature is nature is quite resilient, and if we humans stop causing trouble, yeah, uh, nature, nature, nature will do most of the work of restoring itself. But we did have to bring back some animals because we, you know, you know we didn't have any, right? So we we brought back uh, the buffaloes and wildebeest and zebras. Those are known as the bulk grazers, and you got to have the big grazing animals. They come along and they eat the big grass, and it makes room for animals that eat smaller grass. And so we They're fertilizing we, the soil on the way. Yep. Yeah, and if you don't have that. Uh, if you don't have fertilizing the soil, then you don't even have as many insects. If you don't have as many insects, you don't have as many birds. Everything is connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. And once we had 100,000 herbivores back, then we could bring back the carnivores. And we've now re reintroduced every carnivore that was ever here. Uh, jackals, hyenas, painted wolves, leopards, lions, and so forth are all back. And this ecosystem is is functioning again. So we had to help it out a little bit, but now, you know, ninety nine point nine nine percent of the work is is done by nature and and not by us. Uh, How do you handle poaching? Oh, that's another big question. Um, you know, because I'm a human rights person, uh, I always like to use dignified names for people. In other words, you never want to start to use a name for someone. Like I, I banned the, the word poacher here. Okay. Ah, it's, thank it, you. It's a human being who's hungry. 
Mm -hmm. And if 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 they're hungry enough to walk in the middle of a dangerous national park in the night and set a snare and try to catch a impala, well, you know what? They need a meal. And so we work with thousands of farm families around here, helping them increase their food. And if you've got food in your backyard, you don't need to go looking for an animal inside the national park. So we don't have poaching. We haven't lost an elephant or a lion in seven or eight years. Uh, the animals are thriving. And and it's just an entirely different way of looking at it. You you yes. you 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 want a national park that is serving people instead of a national park who thinks that people are the enemy. And and it took time to get people to change their mindset. It, mm. When I first came here, that's not how they thought. And when I say they, I mean people trained, you know, in the Western world uh, who who didn't have the connection to nature that the Mozambicans have. Um, that's brilliant. So how would it be possible for other national parks or other places where animals are illegally taken? Uh, how do I put this nicely? How could they implement that same philosophy, that same program? Be the people first, then they're not going to be yeah. as, yeah. I mean, you can. I, I think that that philosophy is spreading. I, you know, almost all national parks talk to each other. You know, we're a little club. We end up in the same conferences, and people are are exchanging visits. So there's there's a lot of interaction and communication between parks, and I think a lot of parks are are starting to approach a, a pro people a view of themselves, and I I hope that it, it continues to to catch on that way. Yeah. And to add on that, uh, our our teams also have been invited to to go to other national parks to to tell them our story. Oh yes, and to, of course, and to give them information on our processes. How are we uh, succeeding? What are we doing? And how are we doing things? So our teams uh, have been going to other parts to explain it. Mm. And not only in Mozambique, even out of Mozambique, explaining what we do and how we do. Mm -hmm. Yes. The work we have done with the communities, it's mm. so crucial for everything we do here. Beautiful. Because community leaders and the entire communities are with us. They believe on what we do. They understand that this is their, their, their work and this is their park. So and this that makes that, uh, that change. Yes. What do you offer for uh, tourists? Because you have another ecotourist program. People can come and do a safari drive. What do you offer those tourists that other parks aren't offering? I would assume it'd be a chance to interact with the community and, and meet locals and really understand yes. the vibrancy of the community yeah they they do that so we've got a group here right now on a national geographic tour and they're here for seven or eight days and they're having wonderful safaris they're seeing elephants and lions and just magnificent beauty but tomorrow they're going to go over and visit one of elisa's girls clubs and i think mm -hmm. that a lot of the people who come here they get you know touched uh visiting the community sometimes that's their the, the high point of their trip my uh, brother Alex just came back from a uh, safari with his family right. and I think he went to Kenya, I think, but he yeah. was saying the highlight, I had a zoom meeting with my siblings and like, Alex, tell us about your latest adventure. And he said, you know, the highlight was uh, meeting the Maasai and playing ball with the kids and just yeah, hanging yeah. out with this, this community and, and yeah. these people are so warm and yeah. wonderful. And we had so much fun. That was his kid's favorite moment. So I can. Well, my family came here and we played soccer against the girls club and we, we lost two to one, <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, indeed. So um, I want to open it up to our, our questions, questions and community, but let's read some from the chat. But if you have questions for Greg and Elisa. Well, uh, uh, Martha, Martha was asking the question about 
bringing in the animals where they came from? Uh, did you did you raise uh, some species in captivity and then introduce them? Did they come from other parks? How did you how did you get the quote unquote replacement? Work animals? with other parks to help. Share. Yeah, we're we're neighbors, of course, with South Africa, and they're a nice neighbor to have. They're, they've got some beautiful national parks. Uh, we were able to get 200 Cape Buffalo from Kruger National Park. Oh, yeah. uh, we were able to get 200 wildebeest. Uh, we've also gone to, to South Africa for for leopard. Yeah. And I think maybe almost every species we've reintroduced has come from South Africa. So they're they're a good neighbor. They got good national parks. And and uh, um, that's that's been our our source. But we may not need to do any more of that. I think now we might have, you know, all the species we need, and they're going to just do fine by themselves. Yeah, fabulous. Uh, Kelly's asking the question about the children at the school. She's saying, what are the ages? And, uh, you know, let me see. Oh, do they have internet access? Do they have internet access? Are they, <laughs> are they connected to the world? Can they have pen pals, I think is what she's saying. Yeah. Kelly uh, also uh, is a uh, grade school teacher. Grade school teacher yeah. with, with young young girls and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As I said before, we work in a very remote area. Yes. In main places, there are no electricity. Right. Uh, yeah. So because of that, there are no computer. Uh, cell phones, some of them have cell phones, but uh, internet is such there is no uh, possibility in such areas. Uh, the kids are still learning, sitting down in, uh, directly in sand. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, schools uh, with good conditions. Right. Uh, yeah, we lack of almost everything. Well, you know, so there... that's why we are also supporting the education system with new schools. We are building mm -hmm. right now 28 new schools. Can and you imagine that? that? This wow. year alone, Lisa is going to build 28 more schools. Oh, um, yeah. Fabulous. Goodness. Fantastic. Wow. And, I, and I have to say, from a Western perspective, it wouldn't be bad for some of our kids not to have internet for a while. <laughs> Shut off the internet. <laughs> Go back to straight learning with families. Is this the inner screen yeah. that you're looking at. Yeah. Of course, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a different generation. Yeah, come here and you can <laughs> detox from your internet habit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Martha, go ahead and turn on your mic. You have another question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Give Martha a chance to turn on her thing. There she is. I apologize for not knowing more about your park. Um, I just uh, haven't been around and paying attention. So I, I have so many questions about um, did you have to reintroduce any of the native plants? Um, did you have to do any conservation or? or uh, replanting of any of the areas. It sounds like it was quite destroyed before you all started this. This, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, fortunately, uh, the, the grasses and the small plants were here, which is really important to have that foundation upon which to restore the ecosystem. Uh, we do, uh, regarding plants, so we have had to restore some, some native rainforest. And, and that's real scary to lose the rainforest because yeah. it doesn't come back quickly. So we work we work hard on that. Um, and and frankly, we're going to keep doing that probably for a couple more decades. Restoring How many the trees did you plant and what kind? Literally millions. I honestly could not mm -hmm. count. It, it, sitting here today, I suspect we have more than 200,000 small trees in nurseries. We grow little trees, we restore them. It's it's in the millions and millions. Fabulous. Wow. Fantastic. And Martha? I have one other question. I didn't get it into chat. Um, as as the children and, and people become more um, educated in, and certainly more aware of other things going on in the world, what would you anticipate will be oh. their, you know, their work, um, employment, um, how is that going to change how they see their world and what they would want to do with it? You know, I'm sure they'd want to protect the area even more, but do you think that's going to change something fundamentally that could be a danger to what you would really like them to be doing eventually? Internet, 
the internet things aside, what, what will they do with their education when they're done? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at answering that. And then um, I'm gonna hand off to Elisa. So speaking of exchanges with other countries, uh, there's actually a group from South Africa waiting for me uh, to have dinner with them. It's our dinner time. Uh, but Elisa is a lot smarter and clearly more beautiful. Uh, so I'll sneak off, but she'll be amazing to continue the Q&A. But, but I will dive in to your very interesting question real quick. Um, so, yeah, so what, what does the future look like? Mm -hmm. um, we want to help every farmer produce a lot more on the land they have, you know, double or triple their income on what they have. But not everybody wants to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, we're the largest employer in this province. Isn't that exciting? You know, it's like being the largest employer in Arizona, for example, or Idaho, where I'm from. And and so these are lots of good jobs, all kinds of jobs, jobs in tourism, jobs in management, job as a ranger. Now, those people go home to their communities, they spend their paycheck, and that creates more jobs. Now you've got markets springing up, somebody's building a house, you know, and so forth, and you get an economy spinning. So we really do need to create more jobs. And in agriculture, you don't just want to grow it, you want to process it, right? That's how you get more value and brand it and package um, it and sell I just it. Just sell the raw so goods, do... sell the finished product. Yep. Why? What is your personal philosophy? How did you get to the point where you were a successful entrepreneur? You had resources, you could do anything in the world. Why this? What? How did you come to the fact but, you that- You know, I- I I accept your question as a good, fair question, but I would turn it backwards. Why in the world wouldn't anyone do this? I, I'm confused by people who make money in a company and then think they got to keep making money all their life. You know, when is enough enough? And right. and why don't more people turn to philanthropy, which is so enjoyable and, and, and good for the soul? So to me, it's just very natural. Of course, I, you know, I was invited here. I'm happy to be here. Um, and uh, I, I like building schools for children. You know, it's, I just, I can't imagine anyone who I'm completely confused when I read newspaper articles about billionaires and wanting to make another billion. And I just, I, it's like, why is that? You know, mm -hmm. good, what, good, good, what was your childhood and your upbringing like, or where did you get this awareness? I ask because it's rare. It is too rare in our society. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I grew up in a family where my father said, must give back, find a way to give back. That's your most important legacy. How did you? Well, you know, that? I was, I was on a CBS news program called 60 minutes and with a journalist called Scott Paley. And at the end of that, I just looked at the camera and I said, hey, all you billionaires, why don't you do more philanthropy? It's really fun. And I, I just, I'm more mystified by the people who don't do it. I, I, it doesn't seem at all puzzling why someone would want to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm, a, I'm as happy. I'm, I'm a little boy that crawled inside a National Geographic magazine. And I'm living there and I'm having the greatest time of my life. <laughs> Good job, Greg. <laughs> uh, Good job. I, I, Enjoy Elisa your dinner. Now Everything I said that was incorrect. Yeah. Wow! Well, <laughs> thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. And thank uh, Martha. Did you have you? Are you have another question? Or are you complete? Yeah. Well, I do want to hear more about the schools and the kids. I just yeah. that that's stunning. The amount of work and and the number of people you're reaching. So I'd really like to hear more about that. Yeah. Thank you, Martha. Yeah. Don't that, go that, away. Let's yeah. add Kelly. She had a question as well, I think. And well, Ke Ke Kelly a... being a school teacher here. In the yeah. US. Just add Kelly here. Uh, okay. Let me go get her Because on. we're talking about girls' school. We have other uh, questions yeah, for you, Lisa, but let's look at the girls' school. Well, I, I, of course, you know, this is, this is the subject dear to our hearts, we women, right? We live in a society in which we were empowered to make choices, to see different futures for ourselves. And this is one of the greatest gifts. Yeah. Yeah. that we can give one another is yeah. new possibilities, new new stories that we can share, not only for ourselves individually, but for ourselves collectively, right? When women are able to take our rightful place side by side with the men, that's when we can change our world. Yeah, yes. Our voices are needed today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. hello. Hi, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Please introduce. Thank you, I'm <laughs> 
I'm Vasco Galante. I'm the director oh, of communications. Oh, Vasco. Oh, I was hoping to meet you. Thank <laughs> you. Pleasure to meet you, yes. You're the communications officer there. You're the networker, <laughs> I understand. You're a vital piece of this puzzle. It's good to have you here. Yes. Yeah. yeah so we yeah, just yeah. had to... Wonderful, a wonderful discussion so far. Just bringing into into focus the the uh, the overall vision and, and the size and scale of what's been accomplished and where it's going, and the inspiration to all of us. And I, and we were talking about the girls' school uh, empowering young women. Um, and he giving, was listening. I'm yeah, sure giving them the tools. So, so yeah, we're yeah. just really pleased with with that uh, that element. And I Lelania has that. her hand up. Uh, add Lelania to the question. Hello, Lelania, do you, yes. Hello, thank you. It's so inspiring what you have done and thank you for the stories. And um, um, I guess my main question is, how did you go from ground zero after the war to starting the project? It sounds like you have um, a supportive government that perhaps asked uh, Greg and others to do this. It starts with the government that, that wants to make this happen yeah. and finding partners, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but what if you don't have a yeah, government so that wants to help? <laughs> yeah. So initially, Greg Carr, maybe you have already told this, sorry. Uh, he was invited by the former president of Mozambique, Jyoti yeah. Shisani, and uh, he came uh -huh. here in 2004. He found uh, a national park that was totally destroyed by the war. And he agreed on a long-term agreement with the government, initially signed in 2008, to restore Gorongosa for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And recently, in 2018, this agreement was extended to 2043 for more 25 years. But basically, everything is a joint effort it's between the government and the CAR Foundation. And of course, we have many, many partners that are helping us, you know, the, uh, countries like US and, uh, and Canada and Netherlands and uh, Ireland and Norway and Portugal. So it's a joint effort with where 99% of the, the, the workers of the, the, the project are Mozambicans. Yes, that's wonderful. I appreciate that you look at it like a laboratory. And so you must sit down and say, mm -hmm. here are the key questions we have. Here are the ways that we can tinker with this and see our results. How are you, how are you making this a scientific well, project? What are the Greg, Greg since the beginning brought the, the the perspective of someone that is coming from the business side, from the entrepreneur yes. side. Yeah. So uh, so we are, and since the beginning, he, he, as you know, his background is human rights. So since the beginning, he was looking at this as let's create a different national park. Let's follow the 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 the, the ideas of Mandela. Uh, about the having a park that is open to everybody. And so since the beginning, this park was for Mozambicans. Of course, we are very happy to have here visitors, international visitors coming to, 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 to Mozambique to visit Gurungos. And it's, it's a paradise, it's a, a beautiful place, of course. And now it's kind of restored, so people can here have a wonderful time. We have our... We have waiting for us now <laughs> several uh, dozens of uh, U.S. visitors from Idaho, uh, and we have always people here from you know 70 different universities that are coming to study and understand uh, the biodiversity of the park, but also the social relations with the, all the communities around us. Yeah. So this is really a laboratory indeed. We, yeah. indeed. we indeed we have five laboratories in the park that people visit here. So it's an amazing place for scientists and for social researchers, I would say. And of course, the biggest department is Elisa's. Elisa's yeah. with the human development and livelihoods. It's yes. basically the real thing. The main difference from us to the other parks, I would say. It is a, a park without boundaries. It's open to everybody. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, Anything else? Uh, uh, Lelena. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm just, um, I live on Maui and we just had a horrible disaster here. And, um, and now we're hearing that um, our state government wants to, uh, make our island into the first smart digital island with AI. And we're all, us locals and local Hawaiians are just, of course, totally appalled. So what I'm getting from you is that human rights, communities, education, human development, and livelihood were your foundations. Of course, you had this support of the government, which um, it appears we don't have at this time. But I think those human um, 
human rights and the other things you mentioned that I just said um, are so important to have first Mm -hmm. over money. And so you've really inspired me to work here to bring those values into our redevelopment. And I just want to say thank you for what you've done. It's so inspiring and so beautiful. And the other thing is, you know, I mean, I I live in a world of TMI, too much information. I mean, to even imagine the rural communities living with nature that you're dealing with is just, it's just so beautiful that you're bringing them into this crazy, crazy uh, AI world. Um, But honoring their natural land and who they are and their history and their culture. It's just so, so beautiful. So I just want to thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much, Lelania. I mean, that, that, that gap nice between that gap between AI, artificial intelligence, and human intelligence. What is it? Like I mean, the, it's, yeah, it's this yes. huge gap, and we have this whole cultural thing that's happening. And then we see the other side of the world where not only is it not talking about uh, AI, but not even talking about internet. They're talking about life. They're talking about the senses what technology of- technology are we really um, yeah. looking at, right? Yeah. yeah, values, values. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What technology and, yeah. really has come to bear, but look at what nature's provided, look what indigenous cultures have used forever, right? Isn't that where our resilience lies? If we don't have that, what do we have? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And, it's a big and, philosophical question, yeah. isn't it, Elisa yeah. and want, Nazca? Just one final comment to Lelania, and then we'll move back to this. I just wanted to say the the, the situation in the, in the present time that's happened in Maui, uh, in Hawaii, is is indicative of lots of things that are happening right now. There's huge fires happening in Western Canada. There's all kinds of things shifting and changing dramatically. But in the case of Hawaii, it's going to be it's going to be the native Hawaiians who have to have the strongest voice at the table. They have to have the absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm and I'm I'm meeting with them after this meeting. So for you. we're going to do it. We're going to do uh, what you guys did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You can point to Gorongosa and say, yeah, look yeah, at the values yeah, they that really they should had watch. in place. They need to watch yeah. this presentation. Yeah, exactly. Well, this brings yeah. up uh, a history, and you can both speak to this, but. In Africa, too many countries have come in and said, oh, we're going to loan you money. We're going to build your infrastructure. We're going to give you this technology. And then it doesn't work. And then they take resources out for repayment. But it was like almost a con game to begin with, wasn't it? So you've got a completely different model going. Can you speak to the history and how just the very system needs to be reset along the lines that you're doing so you're a shining example of how to do it right can you speak to that and and the history so many of us don't know that yeah. history you know since the beginning uh, I, uh, I witness of this greg Carr uh, sought i cannot come here and say do this do that you know i cannot right. come here with western mentality and start yeah. giving directions and, and objectives and so on we start by listening what the local people were really needing from us. And they said, well, we need the school, we need the health center. And where do you want these things? And so that's what we started. And Lisa recently, Elisa started a beautiful project. Maybe you spoke about it, the preschools. Yeah, yeah I didn't speak. Okay, so we start, imagine the kids here, um, uh, it was so funny at first. We, we, we are working in 100 primary schools and now we are working in six preschools, but we want 100. And so this is a, one of the projects that just started. But the first day that we started the preschool, it was just for 80 kids. But uh, 150 kids showed up and we didn't send back anyone. And so for the first time, kids that are four or five years old are going to be prepared to go to primary school and they receive a meal. So what we are, I'm saying is nothing beats from someone from the US or, or from Europe coming here and go to one of those preschools and realize how happy these kids are. You know, it's, 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 it's nothing to do with our Western experiences to see yeah. just how joyful, how playful, how the teachers are so involved with them, how the kids play, how Elisa plays with them, all the, the old, old monitors. And, you know, this is, and every day is like this. It's 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 a it well, education so in our country is in a crisis. So maybe we can take a page from your book. 
right? Yeah, some of the fundamentals. Have we have worked. teachers from a uh, university of, of Idaho coming here precisely to to help us with the preschool. Yes. And at the end, they said, oh, we learned so much here. Yeah. <laughs> they have all, Thank you for the education. This, I can't yeah. wait to get home and share this with my students. Yeah. <laughs> they have all this sophisticated education skills that they learn in the US or in Europe, but they arrive here and they see the real scene, you know, the real yeah. people and the real needs. And uh, of course, it's very different. It, you know? Yes, very yeah. different contest. So I would say, come, come here and, 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 and share with us and, and see what we are doing. And uh, of course, mm. we need help. Of, uh, that's 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 vital. But uh, it's um, a life-changing experience coming to yes. a place like this and um, how nice okay, the people well, are, how the kids are. For I will say that those of us in the West, right, who grew up, I mean, I didn't choose to be in this culture. I'm born to it, right? I have to make my way. I have to navigate my way through this. But all of us are here are seeking this deep connection with nature, mm. seeking a deep connection with our soul. And we have so many distractions, so many um, pulls away from this, so many demands on us that take us away from this. So what advice would you give us to reset our society um, in the midst? This is hard. Western society. <laughs> to find our way. I saw, out. But what lesson can you today. give us <laughs> about Life is what happens when we are not with the mobile in our hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah. and here, there are many opportunities where we don't need the mobile in our hands. Oh, we are wow. just talking. No, we are just talking. And, <laughs> and, and of yes. course, we go here. We have this beautiful African sundowns with elephants and lions and hippos and buffaloes. And, and this, is, uh, this is the bonos we have. So working yeah. with beautiful people. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people that are really needing support and are mm -hmm. waiting, trying to have a better life, and we are trying to help them for that. But at the same time, we have an African paradise. Just you know, we are having this conversation now, and there are water bugs, you know, antelopes exactly. right there, you know, <laughs> just 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 uh, twenty meters from us. Sometimes we have elephants visiting, and so and nothing beats that. You know, it's nature. It's it, and it's powerful, very powerful. Oh, it's so powerful! It's the real that... Lion King story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the circle yeah, the, of life. The circle of life. I have uh, to say that some of my most my most compelling moments, my most memorable moments, have been looking at the eyes of a wild creature. Just sharing that moment mm. eye to eye, yeah. and I remember walking in the woods in like near near my backyard one time, and this huge owl was up in a tree, and it watched me walk under the tree in this woods, and it turned its head around and it just followed my eyes and just to see eye to eye, right, um, mm. was just so just so memorable, mm -hmm. and so there to be surrounded by nature. My sister, who's in the room, will talk about going out on a boat. Kimberly, if you want to tell this story, um, going out on the boat with her husband, out into the wilds, and spending a month just being there on the water, uh, surrounded by nature, out of communication, and just how nature takes over and becomes just part of your inner landscape, mm -hmm. and how you settle into her vibrations. And how you return to something so essential, right. something that we knew when we were all hunter gatherers, when we were all dial it back, we all shared that same source. Yeah. There's just something so magical about that. So I will say that we all seek that in some way or another. And so, yeah, we need to spend time out, out yeah. in nature with yeah. you. I think going back to Africa, going back to source, we all need it's to do home. That. Yeah. It's, it's home. home for, it's yeah. home for our soul. Yeah. 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 Well, so, um, so Kimberly, leave, jump on. I'm sorry. I oh. was saying that we need to <laughs> listen our nature. Yes. We need to listen. Mm. Yeah. We are not listening. Yes. Yeah. This is my sister in her jammies. It's early <laughs> morning jammies. in the Pacific. <laughs> 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 Yeah, hard song that is so appropriate, Kimberly. Yeah, it's pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to be with everybody. Yeah, nature is, uh, yeah, our church, our everything. And it was wonderful to go up into the wilds of Canada and just be part of the, the whole thing. There's the eagle, there's the whale, there's all of it. And you just, you know, you are part of it. And it just feels so good and so natural. Yeah. 
Tell us about your rock star husband playing the guitar out on the boat and who was the audience? Oh, the that was great. The eagles and the orcas. Yeah, so we were uh, anchored out and then we took our little Boston whaler and there was this particular uh, spot where there was this big cliff. So Steve has got his guitar and we're in the boat and he's singing. And all of a sudden there's a couple of uh, big pine cones that get knocked in the boat. <laughs> And we look up and there is a big raven and he's watching. They're knocking stuff into the boat because it's such a sharp cliff. And then we look around and there is a bear and it's on a rock like this, just watching. Um, and, um, that was pretty <laughs> remarkable. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's the eagle and then there's the killer whale and the other whale. And not that I felt like I was in a Disney movie, but it was just so magical. And um, yeah, that was that was a huge uh, moment. Uh -huh. And Steve just singing and playing and all the all the animals coming and listening and yeah. going, yeah, this is great. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Thank you, Cam. Uh, Thank, Thank you so you much. Thanks Good morning. Yeah. Bring him to the I think yeah. our elephants love to love it. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I've seen the videos online where somebody is playing a piano and the and the elephant just starts dancing to it. Well, I mean, just yeah. magical. Yeah. Wow. We have a friend up in uh, the islands of uh, the, the Salish Sea, the, the San Juan Island, and he would stick a hydrophone down oh. and start playing to the orca and the orca would sing back. Yeah. I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Paul will play his flute to the crows and the crows will sing back. Um, it's just um, just to have those moments. I want to yeah. come back also to education, this idea. Of, of, it's part of our education, though, isn't yeah, it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, what Elisa was talking about, and I know Kelly's been waiting to ask oh, her Kelly. question. Yeah. Kelly, can we have you join us now? I'm going to put you here. Are you right here someplace? There you are. Hello, Kelly. Yeah. I'm an educator as well. Yeah. I have enjoyed this so much, and I'm so... um. I'm just amazed by all the all the things that have been accomplished there that with Elise and the schools. Um, I I actually taught preschool for 15 years um, and before and after school. I tend to gravitate to the younger children um, just because I think there's just some something so magical about them learning to do certain things and helping them along the way. And. I think what I was asking earlier was, is there anything that we can do besides, you know, money donations as far as like books and supplies? Um, I know our libraries around here have been discarding and withdrawing books like crazy because oh. so many things are going on to the computer. So yeah. I do this thing where I go around to all the schools and my daughter brings home books that have been withdrawn too. She'll go through the withdrawn section like mommy will want this. Mommy will want that. And she'll bring her back put pack full of books because she knows like she, these shouldn't be thrown in the trash. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So just things like that, um, right. that I feel like our country is just kind of wasting and, you know, throwing away. A tree died and, for those books. Let's yeah, make use of them. Right. Yeah. I mean, some of them are really, you know, good books, but I mean, I'm talking about, we can go back to like, just chill, like little children's books, National Geographic's, just the ones that they made for children, yeah. just for the pictures. And mm -hmm. even if they don't speak English, there's still a lot of books out there with a lot of imagery and pictures that you know good point, Kelly. could be useful when they're going into the trash so like a cultural exchange we, yeah. Yeah. yeah i would like to see books I feel like i just feel i just feel like i want to to do something to help and i wish i could just go there right now but i have a young child so i can't just take off um whenever i want to but i just feel the need to to do something because this is amazing to me that you've opened this many schools with this many kids i mean what a blessing like they are to have it they are to have you good points kelly yeah what can we do thank yes you. uh thank you for that um yeah we as vasco said we only have six preschools now and we want to reach uh hundreds uh hundred preschools so there's a lot to do so any support 
uh, it, it will be much appreciated for us. Um, beside of giving uh, materials that is, is really very important to have uh, uh, didactic materials for kids, we also need a lot of training. Mm. I know that you said that you cannot leave now your country, but if we find people who can come here and train our teachers, yes, it will help us a lot because we are saving materials, but who will use that material? Mm -hmm. Who will know how to use these materials? So there is a, a need to train teachers to use these materials, to use a good methodologies so that the kids can learn something. Mm. When we do our assessments, national assessments here, we find out that uh, uh, kids are not learning at schools. Mm. But this is not because they don't have books. The books are there. Mm -hmm. But the important thing to have at school is someone who can facilitate your learning. Mm -hmm. So we really need to train more and more and more people. Yes. And of course, I, have more I helped that. with a curriculum um, at the, the preschools yeah. that I've worked at. And the curriculum is very important for your teachers yeah. to understand all of before they go into the classroom, um, mm -hmm. especially if they're going to be talk, especially if they're, they're going to be teaching young kids, like put this yeah. in a song instead of um, just mm -hmm. a sentence. Um yeah little things um, of what a what what a one-year-old to a three-year-old how many tasks should they be able to complete you, you know little mm. tiny things are good for the teachers to know as far as um, how how the student is doing should they right. stay back in this class for another year um, so I mean well, I was so western to, I was Kelly <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take our western limitations and impose no. it I think that well, we no, need to I... reset how we educate I think American education is a bit in a yeah. crisis cultural sensitivity and is what so is important story? Right. what are the values that we're right. imparting right. Right. in our education you're right Kelly. can we uh, yeah. yeah I mean what are we trying to teach mm -hmm. and why are we listening to kids and and asking them what it, what do you want to learn but children are so curious, aren't they just naturally? I mean, I remember talking to a mom, I don't have kids, but I remember talking to a mom and she rethought everything about how she was raising her children. And she said to me, you know, when my two-year-old is taking their glass of milk and turning it upside down, I can't get angry. They're being a little physicist and they're wondering how does gravity work? And I thought <laughs> it was so brilliant, you know, just as, yeah. yeah, yeah. What are they actually doing? Yeah. We're not trying to be bad. You brought up but... so many good points, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you for what that sharing. I'd and, yeah. love to share some of the curriculum if they would like to see it. And then maybe one, yeah. maybe I can get there sometime. I will manifest and pray for that to happen. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think we all want to go live in a National Geographic yeah. magazine as Greg was yeah. describing yeah, it. Yeah. You know, this this um, new adventure. I'm Thank good. you, Kelly, for all Thank that you, you do. Thank you, Kelly. I also want to go to Anne next. Can I just say something? Yeah. I would love to see, maybe this is a project that you could instigate if this was part of your curriculum, Elisa, but I would love to see children's stories written and illustrated by the children, mm -hmm. right? I would love, I remember Kobe Kruger. She would, had no relationship to the Kruger National Park by, by marriage, but which she shared the last name, but her husband was a ranger at the Kruger National Park decades ago. And we got to interview her on radio. And she was saying how she raised her family and a couple of lion cubs and dogs in the park. Her husband would bring, this was like back in the sixties or seventies or whenever, but she talked about how her husband would be out and bring home a cub or a stray who'd lost its mom. One was a lion cub and they had a dog and the lion cub was getting bigger and bigger and taking his cues from the family dog. So whatever the family dog did, the cub would do. I mean, this was natural, mm -hmm. right? He was being mentored by the family dog and he was integrated into the family and uh, until he got so big that they had to um, release him. But they said that they would just feed him a really big meal and put him to sleep whenever they had visitors because visitors might be a little aghast at, oh, you got, you're raising a lion cub. But she said the funniest story was when they finally had to leave the park. 
they changed careers and they moved back to Johannesburg. And now they had to put the kids who were like young teens into the school system. And the kids were asked to write a story and uh, they were asked to write about their landscape or something. Well, all the kids wrote stories where the city life was their normal habitat, but they were afraid of the bush. Her children wrote the story where the bush they were felt at home with, they knew how to navigate it. It was, it was their safety zone, but the city was the scary environment for them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, how interesting, how interesting. I would love to hear stories of how it is growing up in your community, in your area from a child's perspective right. and how they would illustrate. I think that would be the education to send those books to our children. Right. right? Well, I think we need to have a cultural exchange as a two-way street of exchange. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, sure. I just want to add that. Lovely, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Thank you for that. I think it's really a very good point. Uh, we did it. We, we have yeah. some. We have we some children's it. book. Yeah, we have some. Very children's related with the book. jungle. Yeah. Of course, we need to do more. I can go and bring. Yeah, just, but uh, <laughs> we, we we do it, and we have some interesting stories that I I, I personally think that uh, have to be shared. We yes. have a story from a girl who was rescued for, for from early marriage. We rescued her from early marriage. We gave her a, a bursary, a scholarship to continue her studies. And now she is a journalist. Ah, so oh. she yeah. is she's writing beautiful stories from for about her life and other girls' lives. So it's some a uh, kind of the desert stories that are interesting to share. Mm -hmm. uh, there are children, there are girls that we are helping them to to succeed in their lives, and um, I think it's important to share these stories. And uh, we we need to do more. Mm -hmm. Vash went to his house to pick uh, the books that we oh we, good we, had. we did uh, related to these stories. Um, yeah, here is Vasco. You can say, uh -huh. this is in Portuguese. Yes. Na selva. It means, who is the boss in the jungle? And it's uh -huh. a, our editor. <laughs> it's no yeah. So, and um, hmm. and it, it was written by, by kids. There is a lot of things. There is another one we have. It's called, it's in Sri Lingo. It's the first Sri Lingo book in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. It's in local language, the same, Portuguese and English. Tales from Gorongosa with beautiful, you know, illustrations and the, uh, and the, um, it's difficult to show it here, but basically, yeah. as um, the two stories told oh, about yeah. the elders of the mountain, and so it's the local traditions, and uh, they they are just telling you know what they believe, how the world was created, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, what is and these are the authors of the the different stories, ah, and so oh, they are all around the fire at night, yes. and um, and the sociology, well, anthropologist was writing, the taking notes, you know, and after he validated everything with them, and after we translated to Portuguese and to English, and uh, it's it's beautiful, and uh, it's local traditions told by the elders for centuries. So these are the beautiful stuff, the the the, 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 tales, the, the the tales told by the local people. But then we have more. This is just a small example. Yeah. Great example. Oh, uh, we, of course, now you've inspired lots of people who want to say, how can I help? <laughs> uh, and uh, so I'm going to start with Anne okay. first uh, and bring her on the screen. Hello, Anne. Hi there. How are you? Got Thank you. you for this just absolutely amazing work. It's really terrific. Um, I am a trained physician, a subspecialist, which I'm saying just because I don't have uh, broad general internal medicine knowledge at this point, but I was wondering if there's any role for physician volunteers. Um, is there anything that people like me, you know, largely retired could contribute? You want to, you want to answer? No, no, you can answer. I'm answering someone here. Okay. Uh, any role for doctors? Can doctor yeah. volunteers? Is there any yes. role for doctor um, volunteers? 
we we sh will share our contact uh, or Elisa's contact that uh, it's already known and she can handle it. She can cre create the connection because every you know for a, for a person like you, a physician, it needs to go. We have to get authorization for the Minister of Health, mm -hmm. so it needs to be established. Thing. So there is some problem with the visas, and so it's it's not a straightforward thing, but it's yes, it's possible. It can be done. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Anne. Okay. Anything Thank else? Uh, Elisa just share an email so you can write to her and explain yeah. uh, how, how long can you go, uh, can you come here, and uh, when, and uh, what what could, could you do? And also do works and with Anne also works with social justice issues as well and yeah. people's empowerment. So, Elisa um, at gorongosa.net is the email address. Put it in the chat room. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah somebody yeah. others were asking similar questions. Let me see. Uh, right. Yeah, now, like Paul McKelly had asked the question. Also, uh, let me see. Lelania was asking about the question. Uh, Martha was asking, "What languages do you teach?" Was that oh, that's a good question. You mentioned Portuguese, yes. English, and your local mm -hmm. language. No, no, we only teach Portuguese in primary school. Ah. So, in high school, they start teaching English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, what's but local the language? No. What's the connection to Portuguese? History. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Portugal was the 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 colonial power here for five centuries, and so when Mozambique yeah. got independent uh, independence, the 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 new regime decided to adopt Portuguese as national language, mm -hmm. sorry, as official language, because mm -hmm. there were too many national languages. So there are in Mozambique more than twenty uh, different mm -hmm. national languages. N none is predominant. And the way to unite the country was to keep using the Portuguese how, how, uh, like it was done for since mm -hmm. the 16th century. Mm -hmm. So basically, yes, then it's why it's Portuguese still the, the official speaking language. In, in so there was a war of independence from Portugal, and then there was a civil war. What was the civil war about? Oh, it's, a, it's a proxy war. You are Americans, you will understand what I mean. So basically, Soviet no, Union no. by then and the US in the other side were not yeah. agreeing that a new communist regime so, was established yes. in, southern, in southern Africa. And mm -hmm. so when Frelimo, uh, the, 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 the movement that fought uh, for independence against Portugal, took power in 75, there were two countries nearby. One is South Africa. The other was by then called Rhodesia. Now it's called Zimbabwe. None were taking it of having a neighbor that was communist. Actually, actually, Frelimo by then was Marxist, Leninist, Maoist. Mm -hmm. This was the three. So this was basically supported by Soviet Union and uh, China. And uh, in '76, um, the, the 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 apartheid regimes nearby and helped by the Western, especially the U.S., created the Renamo. The Renamo was the opposition, and uh, there was this bloody civil war that lasted for 16 years and caused one million deaths. No, oh, for me in this part oh. and ruined the country, basically ruined the country. And and in Gorongosa, just you know, killed um, one hundred thousand animals. So basically, yeah. this part decimated by the soldiers that were fighting here and eating meat every day. Yeah, and, um, yeah, horrible. So. Oh. But it was a proxy war, so it was about uh, the powers uh, dominant do dominance and the trying to control this important Indian Ocean because Mozambique has a very extensive coast. Mm -hmm. It's a very important uh, strategical place. Yes, um, connect connecting the Asia with uh, with uh, with, uh, with the other continents, basically coming through mm -hmm. all the coast, and so is 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 about strategic powers and dominance. Yeah. 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 Same old story, isn't it? It's a story we've heard over and over. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. It's every, every day. Yeah. How did you find your way there, Vasco? Well, um, being Portuguese, I was uh, um, I was born and raised learning about Mozambique and Angola. And so uh, it, it was part of our uh, Portuguese history. And so there was this strong desire for me to when they came and see by myself what I was reading in books. In case of Gorongosa, it's it's funny. When I was six years old, I went to the movies for the first time in my life to see a movie called uh, Ten Commandments from ah. Cecil B. DeMille with yeah. Charlton Heston. Yeah. And imagine the film before the, 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 the documentary before the movie was a 10 minute film about Gorongosa. So oh, how interesting. Six, first time in my life I saw in this you know big room, dark screen, dark, dark room, big screen, the a documentary about Gorongosa that we have in our website. 
And so it was fascinating with seeing all this iconic uh, wildlife of Africa. And I said, one day I have to go there. So I came in 2005 and I visited a place that was totally destroyed without animals. And I met Greg Carr and he invited me to join the project. So here I am after 18 years. Well, speaking of imagery, let's throw up a few slides so people get to see what we've been talking yeah. about for the last hour or so. Yeah. Um, this is the girls' mm -hmm. school, right? The, the girls' academy. Do you want to say something, Elisa, on this? Narrate a little bit? Yeah, they are yeah. Doing. Yes, they are doing some art at girls' clubs. Girls' clubs. Uh, yes, this is from girls' clubs. So we are teaching them not only maths and uh, literacy and Portuguese, uh, but we are helping them to, to learn other things that will help them in their lives. Uh, we teach them sewing, we teach them uh, about nutrition, we teach them about many things that they need. Hygiene, Hygiene sexual and reproductive health. Uh, so the, the girls clubs are sessions where the uh, girls learn how how to live and how to be uh, responsible for for their own lives and for the their environment yes beautiful gotcha. yeah and of course this is some of the sites that you would see at, at part of the ecotourism right well and, you sent me these pictures Vasco. so yeah so they're you. not necessarily in order but we just thought we'd throw some yeah. pictures so people get a taste but yeah. you're welcome to <laughs> yeah uh-huh yeah. Yeah. yeah it happens all the time yes you know, yeah. beautiful the, yeah. the, sacred, the, the sacred water. Yeah, we have a beautiful mountain that is the source of life for the park. So we are in the Rift Valley, and uh, there is a mountain nearby on the western side that provides all the water, the perennial water for the park. And this is uh, the Murumbosi waterfall, so one of the, the, the beautiful rivers from coming from the mountain. Yeah. You can get up close and personal with those animals, can't you? Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. Oh, and then this the dugout canoes. The, oh, yeah. yeah. And and the, what is the name of this river? Where are we looking at? Pungwe, Pungwe River, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to be careful because there are crocodiles and, and nipo, hippopotamus. So we have. Oh yeah. Uh, now, so now, 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 now with, with tourism, we are doing a, using a better boat, a more robust mm -hmm. boat. But if someone <laughs> wants to have adrenaline, we can do the the yeah. canoe. But yeah. that, it's on request. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. Like... African Sundown is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Three is the name of the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our, our rangers, you know, doing, we do walking safaris. So it's possible to see uh, wildlife very close. Yeah. This is a water boat, one of the, is the, the most prolific uh, antelope we have in the park. We have more than 60,000 of these water bugs. Ah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. that's gorgeous. Mm. Oh, my. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. So exotic. Yeah, it's a very beautiful. Lots yeah. of lions. <laughs> yeah. These are beautiful. These are the cyborg antelopes. So uh -huh. um, it's a, you see a male, a big male, and they're the okay, the lion cubs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Gorgeous. Nothing. Nothing and the lion gorgeous. house, you have to tell us oh, well, the next slide. I haven't got there yet. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And these beautiful trees, the the, the, the yellow, yellow mm -hmm. fever trees, the acacias. Tell us about okay. this lion house. This was famous. And you there's it videos is. online of them climbing up those spiral stairs. Right. right. So this is a, this was built in 1940. It was the first camp of the what was then a reserve. So the park became park in 1960, but uh, in 1940 it was still a game reserve. And uh, someone arrived to a huge floodplain that was packed with buffaloes and zebra and with the wildebeest and decided to build a camp there. So they built uh, four bungalows and a restaurant. And uh, that was in the floodplain. It was the wrong place to build it. And so every rainy season that uh, the, 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 the area was flooded and the water basically arrived to the roof. Uh. And so it was not really a place for a tourism camp. Right. And so it was abandoned in 1942 and the lions took over. The lions found a nice place, you know, <laughs> that with, with the terrace where they can go and see what's available to eat with the stairs so they could go up. 
<laughs> and uh, there were rooms with shade and uh, cool. So there was whoever from 1942, whoever came to the park till the independence, if they uh -huh. want to see a lions, the pride of lions, they just go they knew the where school. to go. <laughs> and uh, they were always, you know, living there happily. <laughs> you know, it looks like a big cat house. People build these, you know, cat cat structures. Actually, this is Tippi Edren, Tippi the Edren, you know, the actress, the, the Tippi Edren, the actress from the Hitchcock movie The Birds, came here yeah. in the early seventies, yeah, saw this place and said, and said, "Well, I can have this in California." So she built in Shambhala. I know. Oh, yeah. of, of Lion House. And there is a oh. movie called Roar, Roar that uh, shows all these lions living in, in houses, you know, because she saw this in Gorongosa when he came here. She ah, came here. That's the connection. Interesting. Yes, no, I was familiar yes. with her, her story. You Google Pippi Evan, um, Pippi Evan Gorongosa, you'll see the story. So she gave an interview to CBS explaining uh, ah. where she got the inspiration for Shambhala. Ah, okay, Buffalo. Yeah, Buffalo Probably not a good right idea now. to invite them in your yeah. home once they grow beyond a cup, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Beautiful yeah. smile. The people of Carmboza. Yeah. Look at the tree. Oh, look. It's a baobab, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you. Okay. Yes. That's a baobab. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very uh, it's a tree of life. We mm. call it here. Mm. Ah. It's tree full of water. And the fruits yeah. are very strong. They have 10, 10 times more of C vitamin than any other fruit. I think mm -hmm. it's very powerful. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have some baobab it's powder. It's supposed to be full of vitamin C and lots of nutrients. So. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. We have many, many baobabs in the park. Beautiful yeah. trees. Yeah. Just getting and a feel for farming. the people. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So I think, well, that's, yeah. I think that's all so I this have. Is yeah. Yeah. around the park. Yeah. So, so yes. So yeah. Someone is just working on the field. Well, fantastic. Thank this, you so much. This is just, this. A, yeah, and we definitely would like to stay in touch any way that we can be supporting. As you could tell, so many people feel a connection. And the girls' school, the girls' club is something that uh, I think everybody was immediately uh, impacted by and would love to be in a supportive role in that way if we can. And the education the girls aspect. Girls' club versus the girls' school. What does the club do that the school doesn't? I just wanted to know the difference between the two in terms of their programs. Okay, we, in the girls clubs, we support girls uh, after the school, after yeah. the lessons. And yes, after school. Day. So there is, there is after school club. So if they go to school in the morning, in the afternoon, we do the after school. So we mm -hmm. help them do their homework and we also do all this information that I, I talked about, mm. about sexual and reproductive health. At school, they don't do that. Yes. They don't teach uh, uh, about that. They don't teach how to to, mm. to sew. Yeah. Eh? To we, sew. we have a video that could be interesting in yeah. our know, website. If you go yeah. to gorongosa.net, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see, or gorongosa.org, mm -hmm. you'll see, um, if you type girls club, there will become a movie uh, that explains what the girls club do here. There are no really yeah. uh, uh, girls schools because all the schools here are for for boys, boys and girls. girls. Yeah, we we created the girls club because here the girls are at risk. You know, the, yeah. a girl uh, here is married when she is thirteen. Yes. That's the reality. I mean, we've changed. We, we have been changing this paradigm the, here yeah. with the girls' club because yeah. we want to keep girls in school. So that, that was the late motive to create the girls' school is to keep girls in school and avoid early early marriage. And yeah. we are succeeding. And we engage boys as well mm -hmm. in these girls' clubs to so make sure that boys understand the importance yeah. of girls' education. Yes. And yeah. we also engage their parents. I was going well. to ask how are the parents taking to this because it's hard yeah. to change a cultural tradition, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And maybe there's yes. an economic basis for marrying your daughters off. Maybe um, maybe it's expensive to keep them. Maybe that's just the way you want to create more helping hand. I don't know. How are the parents reacting to this and supporting this? Yes, we do have uh, godmothers and godfathers. Ah. So uh, the parents, uh, the community parents, some selected uh, members who work with girls and boys and mm. work with other parents as well. 
So mm -hmm. when they find um, some problem or a girl at risk, they just interact with the, 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 the families uh, to make sure that that girl will not marry at that time. And they make sure that girls are at school. So we do trainings to them. We need to train them. We give them that information of mm -hmm. uh, the importance of education and they are engaged in our work. So they accept it. And they are like uh, examples. They are role models for mm -hmm. other parents, for other community members. And it's so, so important to get help where you can, where you need it, right? I mean, our society can take a page from that. I think that it's so unnatural for nuclear families to exist in isolation without the grandparents and the cousins and the sisters and brothers and all the support oh, the of the God. family, yeah, yeah. right? The godparents. And so, I mean, I think, my gosh, we're a broken society in and in so many ways, in different ways. But for nuclear families to not have that built-in support, but you're doing it on a community-wide basis to help change the norm, right? So you need you need icons to help change the norm, a place where it's saying it's okay to do this, and here's yeah. why to help educate. That is so important. It's hard to change without yeah. the support of those around you. It's really difficult to change social norms. Yeah. Yes. Uh, People need to understand why and so that they can engage with you. So what we are doing is to work with the community leaders. If the community leaders are with us, so it, it makes more easier to work with other community members. So we engage the whole community. And now we have that child protection committees. Mm -hmm. within the communities yeah. so that make sure that that community will be aware of everything that happens with the child with the children yeah. so they defend they they are there to to protect uh children so it's possible to do that when we work closely with community leaders and the other community members mm. and that support's just yeah. there it's just there, yeah. One, yeah. one fascinating yeah. thing that uh, struck me a lot is when we start the girls, the, the preschools, mm -hmm. we decide we are going to give food to the kids. You imagine what happened? The parents, the mother especially, came and they cook for 150 kids. So we brought food, they brought food, they brought uh, you know their, their yeah. expertise. And so it's a community activity. All the mm -hmm. parents there, uh, you know, understanding the importance of, of this uh, initiative and trying to make it happen mm -hmm. and be successful. Mm -hmm. And so every day there are always mothers there, uh, basically mothers, not so many fathers, mm -hmm. but there are always mothers there helping and, and cooking for the kids every day in oh. order that it can be in school. Yes. Yeah. All pitch this this was what I was talking about. So in our website, we have a Girls Club video. If yes. you go to brother.org and type and search for Girls Club, you'll see there is a video that explains uh, with more detail what is the what is all about. Girls Club. What's fascinating to me about your whole program is it's so integrated as a system. It's not one piece. It's everything mm -hmm. working together. And you started out by listening to the community and then designing around what you heard from the community, from the environment, from, I mean, so what did Greg just sit down and say, hey, let me listen to the community. Did you in the beginning 20 years ago have dialogues? We, Were you we, truly? We had, we had many dialogues with local community mm -hmm. leaders and after yeah. with the mm -hmm. people. And of course we, we brought people that are competent and skilled and now knowledgeable like Elisa that to, to run the, the project. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to design programs around the needs. When you look yes. at America today and the divisiveness that's that's really splitting us apart, what advice would you have oh. for us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't choose anyone for being Democrat or Republican, you know, it doesn't matter. We don't yes. care. Yeah. It means yes, if they are Renamo Freelib, we don't care. If yeah. the person is competent, let's let's give it a job. So the ideology is not a problem anymore. Yeah. You know, we don't yeah. we don't work like that. You know, it's there is no this 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 cleavage that we see this device that we see in, mm -hmm. in the US is a little bit strange here because here everybody the motto is stem juntos. That means we are together. We as persons, we are persons. 
before being anything else. People first. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and so that's, um, that's probably one of the reasons of the okay. success is this capacity of work together and try to have common objectives. Mm -hmm. I think bottom line, when you really sit people down together, we all want the same thing. We all want a system in which we can all thrive, where we can all be heard, where we can flourish, we can be happy. How how did we get so far apart in those goals? Mm -hmm. So, if we all speak to, speak different languages, we have different cultural backgrounds, but humanity is humanity, and it seems like mm -hmm. the stories yeah. continue, and we see it over and over again, no matter where you come from, and how you can heal and come back and and restore oneself and one's mission and yeah uh, yeah one's community. So Professor Wilson was saying, you know, the famous Edward Wilson that uh, we gave we have a science lab here under his name famously said this that people prefer to believe than to know uh -huh. and this is very profound i believe i think mm -hmm. it's very yeah. profound tell us about so, eo wilson or who are you quoting so we can look him up tell us a bit about yeah. him so he was a professor at harvard for more than 50 years he was a professor of biology uh, he wrote many many books um, one is about gorongos it's called window on eternity he came here three times uh, he passed away one year and a half ago, so mm. he said with nine years old, and he wrote the word biodiversity for the first time in a book in the eighties. So uh, he coined the term biodiversity. Biodiversity. So wow. if you look, if you Google Edward Wilson, you'll see there are. We have a beautiful uh, uh, movie about him called The Guide, by a famous movie director called Jessica Yu. She won an Academy Award in the end of the nineties. Um, with the documentary and she made this movie called The Guide um, that was uh, f financed by uh, our Duke's Medical Institute uh, NGO that is helping us We I don't know if Greg told this or Elisa we have a master's on bio biology yeah. conservation mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. science labs we have 12 students from biology from all over Mozambique coming here every two years and becoming masters on conservation biology and this is happen all at the, the, the our laboratory called uh, Edward Wilson. So it's a remarkable place with five laboratories, zoological, botanical, paleontological, ambient, and uh, genetic molecular. And so that's why we have about 70 different institutions and universities from all over the world, Harvard, Princeton, Oxford, uh, Idaho State University, Boise State University, you know, yeah. universities from Germany, from France, from Portugal, from Spain, from Italy, from all over the world. Yes. Coming here to do research. That's one of the, the reasons, because we have these facilities here and we have the, the capacity to, uh, to, to call researchers. And, and it was all a little bit because Edward Wilson was coming here and found this place that he thought, oh, this mm -hmm. is unbelievable. Uh, yeah. Coming to Africa and seeing places like Gorongosa kind of um, made a big difference for such a... As a communication officer, Vasco, I think you had a lot to do with setting that up over the years. I, I was lucky enough to be mm -hmm. here and seeing all this happening here, yeah. of course. And uh, of course, I've been, you know, BBC has been here many times. National Geographic has done nine features films about Gorongosa, PBS, uh, CBS have done 260 minutes about us. Uh, it's yes. not easy for them to do... Uh, uh, repeat so they've done in they came in 2008 in 2022 uh with scott pelly and um you know and there are articles about us in national geographic uh, everywhere in new york and atlantic so there are many people that came here and uh, and so and told different facets different, different faces of this project because there is a this is a big multi-scope project there is so many things to say about it you know we start the coffee project to save the rainforest which is yeah. So because it's shade grown coffee needs trees to give shade to the coffee plants. And at the same time, this so we are saving a rainforest and we are giving more income to local farmers. We start with 13 farmers, now we have 1,000. Mm, so wow. is this things these things happen because uh, there is an initiative, we try, sometimes we error, we we correct, and we mm -hmm. keep going and evolving and uh, and leveraging from that. Mm. That's the way well, to do you know, we need to learn from the success stories, right? We need to learn what are the basic principles and the values and the dynamics and how, how can we reclaim this planet? And, and we, we can't be afraid to fail. You know, the mm -hmm. other thing is we can't be afraid to fail. We have yeah. to, to try and understand. And uh, yeah, after understanding, yeah, okay. we can do better. Absolutely. How exciting. Well, thank you so much. This has been, oh, I'll just real quickly throw it up on screen here, the website. I wanted to mention that, here it is, um, 
there's, Biodiversity there's a in whole, action. Yeah. Whole this is a beautiful film, film that uh, there's many things we've been talking here. Hmm. Yes, yes, it's all across this it's website. Education and health and uh, agriculture. It's beautiful. Ah, mm -hmm. fantastic. This is one. And yeah. also talks about those club a little bit. So it's this is a good one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it gives so much hope to see that there is a formula, there's a way, there's uh, there's a goal, there's a vision for us to reset. I mean, I don't know where we, wherever you are in the world, we can reset and do better, right? We can tinker and find a better way to be more holistic, to be more sustainable, to be more mm. community oriented, to thrive because you're joyful in your work, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. I mean, this is not work, it's fun, it's is it, play. Is this work? Is this <laughs> work? <laughs> you know, I mean, you're yeah. putting your shoulders to the table, but, but at you're getting you, back so much. Yeah, at least you smile the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoy yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so. Yes, there is a question from Anne here. Oh. About uh, oh. equality programs. Yes, mm -hmm. please, please. She's asking, yeah. she's, can you say more about Men for Equality program oh, regarding the gen, gender equality aspect? Of Any it? lessons mm -hmm. regarding that we can learn from you? I think there's a few. Yeah. 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 This is a gender program, basically. It's a gender wow. program. What is interesting here is that here in Mozambique, most of the programs, gender programs are run by, by women, by women. Ah. But here in Gorongosa, we decided to hire a man to run this program, to run gender program, because we found that um, we need to have a man to talk to men. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so men, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, during this year, because this started uh, last year, and during this year, we, we really work uh, within all the programs that we have, we include aspects related to gender. Mm -hmm. So this is to make sure that our programs are gender transformative. Yes. Gotcha. So we work together with gen with men and women. Because and equality is at the basis of our... equal, Yes, this is a it's mm -hmm. a, a men for equality. Mm -hmm. So uh, we make Everybody sure that be heard. women. Yeah, they can feel that they have rights. Yes. They, they have to know that they can speak. They can participate in decision-making uh, 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 forums, for instance. And yeah. now we have, when I, I, I go around Buffer Zone, I found a woman and I, I ask them, what changed in your life? And they say that I... I didn't knew I didn't know that uh, I can be heard by the chief of the locality. Yes. I didn't mm. know that I can raise my voice. I can speak loudly and 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 give mm. the, the audience my opinion. Mm -hmm. And now I know that I'm important. Yes. I, I'm, I know that I have to educate my, my children. Equally, either uh, 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 girls and boys. Yes, yes. I have to educate them equally. So it's wow. something that comes because we have that program running. So this is a um, a program w which is integrated to yes. other uh, 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 programs. So it's not a, a program which works alone. Yeah, it's a cross, right. it's a cross cutting program. Cross -cutting. Yeah, yeah, it's integrated. It's hard for men and women to work together if the men aren't present. So I yeah. mean that's genius. <laughs> and and also yeah. I think to to hear one another, to be heard is the greatest gift we can give each other. And traditionally women haven't been heard. So um and men as well. Not every man yeah. Yeah. So wow. And, and traditional and society. It's also fun to hear you both out and Greg in full, because we saw the 2022 60 Minutes. That's how we learned about Gorongosa. And um, I wanted to hear the rest of the story. Yeah, I wanted to hear what they didn't have time in their limited uh, 
report to share. And so this has been just fascinating. This has been incredible. This has yeah. been fun to hear the full story and hear from all of you. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you for taking the time, your lady. Audience and it well. sounds like you have all kinds of things going on tonight. And you got oh my gosh. people Diversity. coming. Yeah. Get Audrey. back to the <laughs> University of Idaho. Thank I, you for taking uh, yeah, the time. Idaho and all the professors today. and all the research that's going on. And yeah. congratulations I on your success. That. Thank you so much for what you did today. And uh, thank really you, Basco, for setting yeah, this up with you. us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings from heart to heart. Thank you so much.